each of us all of our time. And I think time and events move on. And uh, it's very, very difficult, in a sense, even for any of us to mm. relate to the future and how we do. And I think that we have to do what we're destined to do at this moment in time. And I think... It's you know, nice to think that they might and revel in the nostalgia for a moment, isn't it? Yeah, that's nostalgia. George Best, what do you think, well, George? I think the thing is, the important thing is that you, you're talking about great players from the past. And, I mean, there, there were some greats from, from, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago up until the present day. And people keep saying, well, you know, it's, it's faster and they're, they're fitter and, you know, things have changed. But they... they they seem to forget that the, the, the players who were playing 20, 30, 40 years ago would be up to date with the training, and, and, mm. uh, but still have the nat natural ability and the natural skill. I think yeah, if you're born to be a great athlete, you can play in any, any period of time. Yeah. Okay, another question here. Yeah, um, I'd just like to put to the, uh, to the panel generally um, their thoughts on there being a second national stadium in the north of England, <coughs> um, perhaps in view of with the England games at Wembley, um, such low crowds with there being... I wouldn't say sort of less interest down south, but... Uh... You would, really. That's what you're trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Not last time. Full house at Wembley. But I get... I mean, it's a question that comes up a lot when we're on our travels. What about it, Barry? A second national stadium yeah. in the north of England? It's been spoken about before. I think there's a case for, you know, if you have uh, different uh, stadiums around, you know, different regions, especially in the northeast, where they love the football. I mean, places like Liverpool, you know, they're desperate to see any game, really. And I think they'd love to see a national side player. I don't know whether it would detract from from the England team because I think they like going to you know the national stadium. Wembley is the national stadium, but if it's not going to be full, I can't see any reason why they couldn't make it a little bit more regional and get the, you know the locals involved. I mean, I don't suppose there'll be an awful lot of Newcastle people go down to Wembley, but I, I think they'd take a lot more interest, you know, if it was on the doorstep. Be a few go when you reach the cup final, of course, though. We shouldn't yeah, forget yeah, no, we no, Sorry, when will we reach the cup final? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I have a questioner down here on the front row? Or have we taken that one? We've taken that, haven't we? Where was I going now? Far end, over here. Can you follow me down the far end? I think we're once again going in amongst the shadows. Here we go. Down the back. Here we go. Cheers, Richard. A uh, question to the panel. Why don't more ex-pros take up refereeing? Why don't more ex-pros take up refereeing? Back up really where we were <laughs> an hour ago. you taking it up. Have you seen the wages they're on now? <laughs> um, I think, it's, I think it's, it's great to look at that way. Um, a lot of these referees now, they start off when, when they're very, very young, believe it or not, the sort of 20s and everything, and go on to take all kinds of tests and everything. I don't know whether footballers, when they come on, especially good pros, want to sort of go through all that rigmarole, as you could say, all those tests and everything to try and be a referee. Mm. I think it's a very, very difficult job. It's a thankless task, to be honest. Mm. Well, I know we criticise them and everything, but it's, it's hard out there, <coughs> especially all the hurly burly. And as we're saying, it, it's very, very quick. You look at the game last night, that was fast and furious. Who'd want to be a referee? Who would be a some referee? Some of those tackles right. are going about. Question for the panel. Isn't it about time we had one organisation to run football from grassroots to international level? In other words, get rid of the Football League, uh, the FA and the Premier League and have one organisation, call it the Combined Football Association. Who wants to go on a disrepute charge? <laughs> George, I think you can take that, can you? <laughs> Again, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you, you know, Richard, you and I <laughs> work together a lot and, you know, uh, talking purely and simply from one point of view, you, some of the people that are running this game, uh, I think it's disgraceful the way that the young kids particularly uh, are being taught, are not taught how to play football. And when you've got the, the top man in the FA saying that Brazil have got it all wrong, I think there's a need to, <laughs> to look at a few people who are running the game. Because if he thinks Brazil have got it wrong, what chance of, of, of kids who are being I thought it was a, a, a great line of Gordon Strachan's the other week at Leeds when he said, we've got to replace the street football in this, in this country because that's gone away now. Uh, he's absolutely right about that, isn't he? I mean, that's where you learnt your game, isn't it? In the street. Yes, I did. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I was talking to Sir John earlier. I do a lot of coaching all over the world. And I've just come back from South Africa. And to see the, the ability that these kids have got, because that's all they have, they've got nothing else. And in the Middle East and places like that, uh, which is why what, what were once classed as third world nations are catching up. I mean, they had a tournament recently in Japan, and the finalists were Ghana and Nigeria. Now, mm. if you'd have said that 20, 30 years ago, people would have thought you were crazy. Mm. And that's because they're playing in the streets, you know, 24 hours a day, basically. Sorry, I keep treading on toes. It's a bit narrow, isn't it? <laughs> Go on. Um, I would just like to ask the panel what the thing about. Um bringing a sort of a rule into the transfer market um, whereby smaller clubs that have players poached away from them should be guaranteed a percentage of the fee.
because you find out that the Premier League, um, compared to the sort of second and third divisions, there's a big gut there now. You mean two and or three back in the sale, those who maybe have sold for yeah, 75 you know, and see someone go for a couple of million? Yeah, well, I mean, somebody might poach them when they're very young and then make, say, three, four million, and the smaller club just kind of compete with that. Okay. A percent, is that not happening a little bit, Sir John? Clubs are getting a bit wary of seeing them sold on for big money and are putting in a, a sell-on clause. Well, you're in the marketplace, and basically, you are doing deals where there's a percentage add-ons. But remember this, if you buy a young player cheap, the club that buys them has got to spend a lot of time and energy and effort in actually developing his talents. And uh, it's, uh, as I say, it's, you're in the marketplace and uh, you've got to do the best deal you can for your business. And uh, at the end of the day, um, I wouldn't be against sort of giving add-ons. Uh, it was all doing at this moment in time. Mm. What about um, something that hasn't come up yet, and I'm surprised that it hasn't. What about the names and the numbers, squad numbers and the names on the back of the shirt? So are we, are we fans of names and numbers? Let's have a little look around here. We're not. Who, who likes names and squad numbers? <coughs> who doesn't like names and squad numbers? That's extraordinary, isn't it? That's an American idea, George, really, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, I personally think it's terrific, you know, because we're, we're commentating on the game, so it makes it easier. <laughs> Particularly when you're trying to, trying to remember the Polish names, it's, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, no, there again, you see, we were talking earlier about uh, experimenting and changes. Uh, and I think in a couple of years, they, the same thing happened when they, talk about, they talked about all seaters. Mm. Fans said that they wouldn't go and sit down and watch football. And now a lot of fans say they don't like the, the, the numbers and the, the names. But in a couple of years' time, you won't even remember them. You know, you'll it's tough it's enough, though, isn't it? It must be hard carrying 36 around for 19 well, years. Well, I've just been, if I was playing, I'd have been 33. My number was 33 at the, in the a, squad. So. A, a squad number, 33. So 11, I'd have been 33, yeah. That wouldn't have been the same, would it? George best in 33. <laughs> I was having another go at the chairman. He knows he's having a good night. Um, I just think... <laughs> I'd just, I'd just like to know um, why, not just Newcastle, but other clubs, um, I think I speak for a lot of away supporters, when you go to an away match nowadays, um, say you're allocated 2,000 tickets, um, is there three or four um, lads who may not support Newcastle, who are just general supporters or whatever, have got booked loads of tickets for that particular away end. Um, I can quote um, the Man United game, for instance, this season. Um, we were allocated a certain amount of tickets, yet there was three or four individuals standing outside with book loads of tickets, selling them in the range between 15 to 25 pounds for the corner of the ground where Newcastle was seated. And I'd just like to know, that, you know, why is it that those tickets are allowed onto the market? So so how, do do know they, how? how do they get them, <coughs> Sir John? No, well, but certainly they shouldn't get them from my organisation because we try to be as fair as possible. It's very, very difficult with a limited number of tickets you get for Man United, and then there's 2,000 tickets and there's 20,000 want to go. We're going to show you if, if that is actually happening. And did the, it actually happen in the Manchester United game? It did actually happen. Well, that's know, something we're not talking about. I can show you it's a lot not of people who have had a, a grudge about that because right. they wanted to go to that game. Well, I, 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 I'm very, very surprised that you're telling me because that should not happen at all. If it is happening, then somebody's not doing the job within the organisation. Hmm. Uh, they were Manchester people, by the way, John, that were selling their tickets. They weren't. Oh. Uh, Sir, John. Sir John. They weren't from the. <laughs> Did I not see another question down here? <laughs> you were having a good night, Sir John, weren't you? Here we are. Just uh, Barry Venison, what sort of class has he found the difference between the first division and the Premier? I think, this season? I think a few of the lads have been surprised. Most of my career I've, I've played like in the old first division, so I wasn't surprised. Some of the lads, people like Lee Clark and possibly Steve Howey, maybe even John Barris, or people like that. And I think they've found that it is a lot quicker. It's quicker in thought. Um, and quicker physically. Uh, if you make mistakes in, in this division, uh, as we'll find out, we'll find out to a cost against Tottenham. And we'll find out in most of our games this season, if you do make a mistake, you do get punished. Well, last season, we got away with an awful lot. Um, I think we did struggle a little bit early on, as I said before. But I think we're fine on our feet now. But I think the younger lads, you know, they're getting a tune trip now. It just takes four or five games, six, seven games, and I think we're getting there. But the, there certainly is. You know, a big gap between the First Division and the Premier League. Now, I saw Malcolm Allison on Sports Saturday at the weekend, George, an old friend of yours, saying that it's actually not quicker now, the game. Uh, players don't need to be quicker. The ball buzzes around at a, 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 a different pace these days. Do you agree with him? He says it's a myth that the game's quicker. Um, yeah, I, I, I never disagree with Big Mal. <laughs> He's too big to disagree with. And he usually buys the champagne, so... I, uh, I think Barry hit the nail on the head there. It's... it's uh, it's quickness of mind, really. Uh, the, the game was fast when we played. Don't any doubts about that. I mean, so we, we, we played in games that were 100 mile an hour. But it's been, been, been quick up here, which makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go right back to where we started, really. Newcastle United back in the big time. We've, uh, 
I think giving the chairman a pat on the back tonight, you're, you're plainly enjoying yourself, Sir John. Up with the big boys now. <clears throat> well, it's, it's where Newcastle should be. And uh, the fans have yearned for this success for 30 odd years. <clears throat> And we've fought many battles in the past to get to where we are. You know, before the, you're seeing success now, but the battle fought by many people over the past five years has been long and hard. And uh, but getting here is the hardest part. We've now got to stay here, and we've now got to build. And we've got we've got history and tradition on our side, but we're not quite an institution. To be an institution, we have to win for a lot of years. We've got to be the, consistently the top for a lot of years. But given time, given a strategy and policy, we'll get there. We'll be one of the top three in the UK and one of the top ten in Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's achievable, Barry. Well, if the chairman says he's the boss, isn't he? It, it must be a nice feeling, though, t t to know that Newcastle can now go out in the marketplace and buy yeah. when the likes of the Waddles and the Gazers and such like are available instead of have to sell, yeah? Well, the ambition's there. Um, what we've got now, we're attracting top-class players now because we are, you know, we've got a, a solid foot in the, in the Premiership. So what people look at us now, I think people want to come to Newcastle where possibly before, where things hadn't gone too well. The fans were starved of success. Mm. Um, I think everything's coming together now and it's... The whole country's looking at Newcastle at the minute. It's, it's a club that's come up and done fantastically well. Um, we're enjoying trips up to the North East, let me tell you that. I hope Thanks, more for the time being. Uh, next week, incidentally, we're talking about international football. Keep the letters coming. We maybe are not uh, mentioning so many as we can at different times, but I promise you they are all read. The address is the Footballers Football Show on the Road, Sky Sports, PO Box 6, Isleworth, Middlesex, TW7, 5QQ. Thanks very much indeed to our guests tonight, George Best and Sir John Hall, Barry Venison and Phil Thompson, and also to you. Thank you very much for having us in James's Park. Enjoyed it a lot. Thanks very much. Yeah.